Hello uh, and welcome to the NIHR Dementia Researcher Mid-Day Lecture Webinar. Uh, I'm Adam Smith, I'm the Programme Director for the Office of the National Director for Dementia Research at University College London and I work for the NIHR and today I'm delighted to welcome Dr Tom Phillips. Hi Tom. Hello. Uh, Tom is a Research Associate at the UK Dementia Research Institute in Cardiff. Um, and he completed his PhD in Bristol and prior to that was a medical student but preferred the lab over the wards which is entirely reasonable. Uh, Tom has agreed to talk to us today about microglia's role in dementia, mostly Alzheimer's disease but I think also uh, Parkinson's as well, and how the role moves between protecting and damaging and how new genetic findings point to therapies. Uh, the title for his lecture is Microglia, a double-edged sword. Haha, <laughs> I've just made it. You've got the sword in the background as well. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to label that as well. Uh, uh, <laughs> microglia, a double-edged sword, a neuroinflammation and new routes for drug discovery. Um, the talk will be around 20 minutes and then we've got 10 minutes for questions at the end, although we know this often overruns. If you have any questions, you can post these using the Q&A button at the bottom throughout any time through the talk or save those to the end if you like. Uh, I will put them to Tom and he will answer them live. We're also recording today's lecture, so if you drop out for any reason, don't worry, you can uh, watch this back later via our website. So uh, thank you very much, everybody, again, for joining us today. And uh, Tom, if you'd perhaps like to share your screen now. Yeah. I'm Tom Phillips. I'm one of Phil Taylor's postdocs working at the CARD DRI, and we're looking at how uh, new risk variants in microglia can affect late onset Alzheimer's disease. So I'm going to talk a bit generally about my clear uh, and information and uh, dementia, mostly about Alzheimer's, but I'll mention a few others like Parkinson's just for context. And then I'll just show a bit about uh, the work I've been doing on the risk variants and how that could lead to therapeutics well down the line. So the CNS uh, innate immune system. Mostly we're talking about my clear, uh, the immunocompetent uh, so the brain, they're essentially a tissue resident macrophage uh, found in the brain. Uh, they've been described for a long time um, and been linked to neurogeneration for a long time. In fact, Alzheimer, when he was doing his first work, noted uh, the gliosis of um, small microglia cells around Alzheimer's plaques. But they have been ignored through most of uh, neuroscience history. I mean, I'm a classical neuroscientist myself, and we tend to focus on <laughs> neurons. Um, but in the last, since the millennium, 20 years, 10 years, they have really come to the fore of a lot of work. Um, and I think they're going to be the focus of a lot of things from now on. Um, unusually for um, tissue resident macrophages, they actually come from the yolk sac and colonizing nest during penile development and then slowly renew. So they're a unique art, um, ecosystem inside the brain in that way. Depending on the atomical region, we're talking about 0.5 to 16% of um, the total cells in the brain. Um, the figure that gets around a lot is 10 to 15%. It does depend highly on the region. The striatum tends to have a lot and the cortex tends to have less. Uh, in mice, it's a bit different, it's about 5 to 12% because uh, less dense neural architecture. Um, and they're incredibly dynamic as a cell. Um, they're significantly shaped by the microenvironment around them, become active and, and um, their passive phases very quickly. And they're also constantly on the move throughout the architecture, patrolling for damage to cells, um, then migrating to sources of injury. Uh, and their real role is maintaining the homeostasis inside the CNS, making sure that dead cells are cleared and that no uh, protein aggregates are forming. But they also have important roles in development where they clear the synapses. Um, during the, so during early development, you have a large number of synapses, I'm sure many you know, which then get cleared into becoming the most useful synapses through uh, our developmental stages. Um, and this is done through a mix of the complement system and my clear uh, synapses. And if that is impaired in any way, it can lead to things like schizophrenia, autism, and other, other mental conditions. I'm going to focus today on neurogeneration. Um, so just talking about three of the forms of neurogeneration, I'm sure everyone here knows. Alzheimer's, Parkinson's are two most common forms. Frontal temporal dementia, the most common for the under 60s. Um, 
And they're all very diverse, so they present clinically uh, lots of similar symptoms, dementia, memory loss, mood changes, that sort of thing. But if you look in the brains themselves, they look very different. So Alzheimer's with its um, amyloid agmates and tau, tangle formations, Parkinson's with Lewy bodies, Um But one thing you do find in common throughout is these activated microglia uh, and new information and the microglosis. So it does seem to be a common pathway that's activated throughout these systems. Um, now that makes a lot of sense. I mean, these are uh, environmental conditions. They are going to activate the immune response and there is going to be an attempt by the body to prevent this uh, cell death and reduce these protein aggravations. But we also see this new inflammatory side of things becoming damaging. And um, in some ways may be of course the effect of a lot of the symptoms we see in the clinic. So I'm going to focus on um, Alzheimer's, as I say, uh, just talking about what Mike Lear do in Alzheimer's. I mean, their major role is clearing uh, amyloid. So amyloid is produced uh, constantly from neurons, and it should be cleared at an equivalent rate of its production. If that uh, production goes above the clearance rate, then we see this deposits and plaque formation, and everything you expect to see in postmortem samples. Um, this is detected by my clear using something called TREM2, which is a sensor on the membrane that detects uh, quite wide array of lipids, um, but they're all associated with uh, fibrillar, uh, amyloid, and damaged neurons. And so that activates that pathway. And then uh, the cells will clear that either by um, basically depending on its size, either microempinosis, endosinosis, or phagosis. But the gist is that it will take in the amyloid into the body and bring it into the lysosome where it'll be broken up. So that phagosis process is the same one that is used um, during development and we have the complement side of it there. I won't really talk about complement because it's complex enough to be its own series of lectures um, rather than just this 20 minute one. The other side of it is the cytokine response. So having sensed this amyloid you get a classical innate res immunity response where the inflammasome is activated, you get pro, um, pro B um, is released and nitroxide and also activation of things like TNF-alpha and R6. And you see these cytokines in high levels in patients uh, with post mortem samples and you can get CNS uh, material from a patient. So you're gonna see these in high levels. Um, and they have quite a varied effect. Some are pretty simple, TNF-alpha and R6 can be increased they work towards increasing gliosis, uh, meeting cell death, um, increasing amyloid uptake. r one b which is a bit more complex than IL-18, is also uh, quite complex, sometimes high, sometimes low. It depends on the time um, that you encounter the patient. Um, but TNF-alpha has been used um, clinically in both ways, both activating and inhibitors have been tested. Uh, I think the inhibitor ones seem to get the best results is a bit varied, um, but there have been uh, positive results from it. So bring that all together, if we think about the classical amyloid cascade um, that John Hardy and co brought up uh, about four years ago now, you get this neurons aging or experiencing stress, uh, producing this increased level of amyloid. The amyloid then uh, causes neuron death as it builds up and also the tau pathologies. Um, and that was the, considered the, the main way this happened, the amyloid cascade. But I think there's been a lot of uh, questions about that uh, recently. I mean, a lot of the clinical work hasn't uh, come out as we'd hoped it would. And it doesn't always line up with what you see in the post-mortem samples. You often see high level, well, often, you, but you do see high levels of amyloid without the same clinical symptoms and low levels of amyloid with the clinical symptoms. So we think there's another pathway involved here. And what most people have been talking about is this uh, might clear inflammation pathway. So sensing this high level of amyloid, these uh, tau levels, neurofibers inside the neurons and the damaged neurons, this activates the might clear as we've talked about. They go to phagosis, the amyloid, the tau, become more active, release cytokines. And this is where it, in the early phase, this is great. We start to clear the amyloid as it's supposed to, remove the dead cells. But as these cytokines build up, as the amyloid overwhelms the mitochondrial response, you get this increased level of cytokines, the chemokines increase, mitochondria are brought across the brain, there's mitochondriosis, an increased number of mitochondria, <clears throat> and this high level of cytokines. And while these cytokines are useful um, 
at first to protect cells and uh, bring more mite glia, they actually become neurotoxic at high levels and so lead to cell death themselves. And the mite glia become dysfunctional at these high levels of microglosis and the high level of this pro-inflammatory environment. And they may then go um, after the synapses and the neurons. So inside Alzheimer's, we see a lot of uh, synapse loss. This has been investigated by people uh, in Cardiff, actually looking at the complement side of things and how the uh, mite glia might be interacting with the synapse. So it's not well understood, but it is believed to be linked to the mite glia dysfunction. And this all leads to this high level of information. And this may be the cause and effect of a lot of the clinical symptoms, because although amyloid is neurotoxic, to actually become neurotoxic to the levels that we see in the clinic, you'd need macro molecular amounts of it inside the brain, or at least in uh, the local concentration. But no information um, can be toxic at much lower levels. Uh, so we're around this amyloid as the microglia builds up, we get the cytokine release causing the cell death. And as I say, one of the key ones is TNF alpha that's released by the microglia. And inhibitors of TNF alpha have been used clinically and seem to show some uh, reduced neuron death around plaques. Etiology wise, there's a lot of risk variants associated with um, Alzheimer's disease. I mean, the ones that everyone's probably heard of, APP, PSN, PSN2, are this familiar linked ones, quite rare, but very high risk. You, if you have them, very high risk of Alzheimer's. Then there are the more uh, medium risk, APOE, uh, 4, and also TREM2 comes in this. It's a low risk, fairly rare, but there are variants there which can increase and decrease your chance of getting Alzheimer's. But more recently, um, people have been looking at rare coding variants. So there was this GUR study uh, that came out of uh, Cardiff in 2017, I think it was, uh, published in Age Genetics um, by Rebecca Sim. And she pulled out several new rare um, risk variants, um, including TREM2, so more variants of that, ABI3, which is part of the actin wave complex, and so affects actin formation inside mite glia. And if we think about that um, in the context of phagocytosis and cell migration, you can see how an increased a mutation in that actin could become a risk variant uh, by inhibiting that process. So the mite glia can be less active, not able to migrate. So people are working on that. The TREM2, as I say, most of the mutations found that have been loss of function. So if you lose um, TREM2 function, you get an increased chance of um, getting late Alzheimer's disease and in various mutations other forms of dementia uh, because the TREM2 is not going to be active so you're not going to get that initial microglia response to the amyloid. And there's a lot of work being done on that. There's also work being done on the complement response and there have been rare risk variants found there for CR2, CR7, CR1 and a lot of lipid metabolism response including phospholipids. Uh, the one I'm going to talk about today is the PLC2. This is the work I've been doing. This one's uh, interesting. It breaks the curve a little bit because the PLC2 mutation is actually protective. So if you have this mutation, you're less likely to get late for so Alzheimer's disease. So as I say, it was came up from the Sims paper originally. Uh, the OR is about 0.6, so it's not huge, but it is present there and will give you some protection. Um, one key thing is, as it's an enzyme, we're talking about a classically druggable system. Um, the first one to emerge from these low studies. And keyly, it's uh, primarily expressed in microglia. So although other uh, cell types like neurons, uh, astrocytes, do have PLC uh, gamma enzymes in their system, because they're ubiquitous through the body, they tend to be the isoform 1 rather than PLC2, which is in the CNS for the vast majority only found in microglia. Now, PLC2 breaks down PIP2, which is a phospholipid, as we talked about being risk variant before, uh, to IP3 and DAG. And IP3 goes to the ER and releases uh, calcium. Now, this calcium response is one of the very early things for pretty much everything the microglia does, activating it. Phagocytosis, endocytosis, receptor signaling, release of chemokines, release of cytokines, almost everything is downstream from this calcium response. And PIP2 is also broken down to DAG, which activates the RAS ERP pathway. And we get a lot of response from that as well. <clears throat> and one key thing to note here is that PLC2 itself is downstream of TREM2. So we're still talking about the same pathway there, as well as uh, DAP12 and SHIP1 being part of a similar kind of pathway, all of which have been found to be risk factors in Alzheimer's disease. 
So when this came out a few years ago, a lot of people started working on it. Um, so the Sims people was the first one to find it, but it's also now been uh, linked to dementia of Lewy bodies, frontal temper dementia, and increased like the, the longevity. Uh, so it's a pretty good thing to have if you can get hold of it. But it may be a risk factor for progressive supernova palsy and multiple system atrophy. Uh, that came from Conway in 2018. That was a slightly smaller study than the others. So I think there's more work to be done there, but it does seem to be some link. And a paper came out in 2019, finding it to be, again, a function mutation. And it modulates tab foliage in the presence of amyloid, according to a recent paper. That's quite a complex thing. So I think this is going to be interacting with a lot of different systems inside um, amyloid pathology and neuron death, which would make sense given the Mike Glear's early role in a lot of these things. So I'm going to talk about, about some data um, that we've just put on the preprint servers, um, looking at Mike Glear for the first time in, uh, looking at BLC2 for the first time in Mike Glear themselves and how they interact inside an in vivo environment. So the models that we did use to look at this was a knock-in mouse created uh, with Jax um, with this BLC2 variant. And we found that this um, mouse uh, produces the variants um, homogeneously and at the same level as the um, wild type or common variant is found in the uh, wild type mouse. We also have three separate isogenic uh, human iPS cell lines produced with this variant um, done by Emily here in the DRI and some homology models uh, done by Georgine here in the DRI, well, she wasn't a DRI, um, where we found that there is a uh, autoinhibitory mutation and mutation in the autoinhibitory domain, making it less active. So that supports again a function mutation that was found before and makes sense with our previous work. So from the mouse model and human IBS model, we were able to produce microglia from the mouse, it's primary microglia from the hippocampus and the cortex. And we also have cell lines from uh, macrophages. So you can take uh, macrophage precursor cells from the bone marrow of a mouse and conditionally immortalize them uh, to estrogen and then have an immortal, a conditionally immortal cell line of MOP cells, which can be differentiated into macrophages. And as the microglia is essentially a tissue resistant macrophage, they are comparable. There are some differences, um, the basic functions maintain. So we had a look um, in vitro here at calcium response. As I say, pils 2s main function is this calcium release from the ER by IP3. Um, and you can measure calcium response using things like FIRA2 and FLO8, which become increasingly fluorescent in the presence of calcium. And if you activate PLC2 with 2.42, which is an FC um, CD32 ligand uh, that binds onto the cell and then activates PLC2, you get this increased calcium response. And the mouse we see there, the red is the um, R522 which is the protecting mutation, and the blue is the common wild type variant. And you get this increased calcium response uh, with 2.42 and also less direct activators like LPS and amyloid oglomas in the cortex of the campus show the same increased response for the mouse. And in the human with uh, anti-CD32, again, the same kind of uh, pathway as 2.42, you get this increased calcium response. Uh, so it's gain a function system. And we know this is directly down to the PLC2 rather than any other uh, calcium causing response inside the cells because when we use um, gamma knockdowns um, of POC2, we can completely inhibit this calcium response. And we've also done various inhibitors and things and have space here to show uh, of POC2 where we can prevent this calcium response. So that's all for the good, but looking um, at amyloid, really we need to think about the functional response. So one of the things we looked at here was phagocytosis. Uh, now, as I described, one of the principal actions of the microglia is phagocytosis and to remove these fibrils. But this is the in vitro study here um, using mouse macrophages from MOP cells, mouse primary microglia, and human IPS uh, derived microglia. Uh, again, the blue is the common variant and the red is the protective variant. And we use Frodo red labeled E. coli and Zomazan, which become 
increasingly fluorescent uh, in low pH environments like the lysosome. So it's a common way of measuring um, phagocytosis and various uptake methods that end in the lysosome. And interestingly, you can see here that the um, response in the wild type was higher than the response in the mutants, just in this lower phagocytic response in the mutants, which was surprising for us because, you know, as I said, we expected to go the other way with this increased calcium response. If you look at endocytosis, however, which is taking up of much smaller molecules, um, and there's a less uh, actin and less PIP2 active system, but still ends up bringing up into the lysosome, you get the same response um, using small pieces of dextran and amyloid oligomers. Uh, measured in a similar way. You can see uh, the diagram, the picture there is uh, green fluorescent oligomers being taken up by uh, human iPS cells. Um, the trend is reversed and the mutation is a much higher level um, than the wild type. So this confuses at first, um, but one of the things I wanted to look at was PIP2. So PIP2 is the substrate that purity 2 breaks down. Um, so as you'd expect, with the increased calcium response and the hyperactive purity 2, you get this higher level of um, PIP2 being broken down, so a lower level of PIP2, which is what you expect from a higher level of enzyme, less substrate. But the interesting thing is that you get a lower uh, or slower uh, return to PIP2 basal levels. Now this is an in vitro measure here. Uh, we did this in several different ways. Um, just showing here some antibody staining. Um, and you can see that in the mutant, we get a much lower amount of PIP2 and it takes longer for that PIP2 to recover, which means the cells have less PIP2 to work with, which is interesting when you consider phagocytosis, for example, which is a much higher PIP2 uh, requirement than endocytosis. And if you look in vivo um, at basal levels of PIP2, these are much clear in purple here. Um, the green is the PIP2, um, and you can see the images are from the cortex, but I've got measurements there from the cortex hippocampus, that we have a basally reduced level of PIP2 in the um, uh, R552 mutant compared to the wild type, suggesting this lower level of uh, PIP2 to work with. So, just looking at this one variant, um, We've got this hyperactive PIRC2, decreased phagocytosis, increased endocytosis with reduced PIP2, or PIP45, PIP2, I should be more specific, in vitro and in vivo. Um, so we have this initial fast response in the cells with the calcium, and it, um, we get a response at lower levels of amyloid or in 4G2 and a much higher response. But that response then tapers off as the PIP2 is reduced. Now, if we think about that speculatively, in the context of the information, um, we're going to get this fast response to the amyloid levels. So the microglia will then be very active and start clearing. But over time, we won't get this extended, increased uh, inflammatory response with myoglosis uh, to the same level as in the wild type. You won't get that same cytokine damage. Um, so possibly that's the link there for the protective side of it compared to the wild type. So when you think about new therapies um, along these lines, positively, several of these risk variants are classically druggable. I talked about PUSA2 there, which is an enzyme. Um, and many of them, because they're based in microglia of neurons, how already have inhibitors and activators that are known, because all of these um, variants are found in macrophages in the immune system and come up in a lot of different uh, conditions like PUSA2, like, um, called PLAD. Um, and other inhibitory conditions. So a lot of people are working on these same um, targets already, but not in the context of the CNS. Um, and because they are leaked to the microglia, we can look at very specific things. So the PUSD2 is not found in neurons, for example, so we know if we use that, we're targeting specifically microglia. But we still have the usual problems of any kind of therapy in the CNS this uh, difficult to reach a CNS because of the blood-brain barrier and it's a unique place in the body. The mechanisms, as I said, are not fully understood. I laid out some speculative work there with PRC2. Um, but as I say, because this microglia has the initially protective response leading to its then damaging response, timing is going to be very important here. I mean, we want to 
upregulate that initial protection, but not get an upregulation then of near information and the cytokine damage of that. So then we want to reduce that, but not reduce the initial response, um, like you see in the trem butins. So I think there's going to be a balance in that there and timing is going to be very important. Um, and one of the things there is to get this condition very early, which is difficult, and understand exactly where you are in the cellular pathology with the patient, which I think, again, is going to be very difficult. As not, it's not clear until you have post-mortem studies. So I think there are um, a lot of potential therapies here, a lot of new routes in, um, some of which have already been dug through uh, cancer biology and various immune uh, conditions. Uh, but there's a lot of work to be done to make them work in the CNS. Uh, so yeah, just to sum up what I've talked about, my clear tissue resident macrophage CNS and the major components of the innate immune system. There is, as I say, complement, and there are macrophages that can cross a non microglia macrophage that cross the blood-brain barrier and the few that are just a resident of the brain anyway. I've not talked about them. They tend to be much smaller in number and the complement side is complex enough of its own uh, to talk for a whole lecture. The neurogenetic conditions, um, the role there is to clear these extracellular protein fibrils and to remove the damaged cells, but the consistent prolonged activation can lead to damage new information. So that's why a double-edged sword thing, which I stole from a much earlier paper. Um, we have this initial protector effect leads to this damaging effect, and I think the balance there is gonna be the real key thing that we're all gonna be working on. Uh, the recent GWAS hits um, for these risk factors have really opened up a lot of doors here, and I think these um, variants hold a lot of uh, therapeutic value that we haven't seen with the classical amyloid work. Uh, yeah, so just to thank everyone, um, Emily did all the human IPS work here, Georgina did the protein structure work, um, and everyone in the card, the Orion, the various groups that worked on this data that I've shown. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. That was fascinating. And it looks like um, you could be researching this for a long time. Hopefully. <laughs> a lot to cover there. Um, thank you very much again. If you'd like to stop sharing your screen now and um, we'll go to the questions. I can see we've already had uh, one. Um, well, they're going to come in now. Uh, the first question is from Daniel Bull. You can see these questions yourself as well, Tom, if you want to click up just in case I pronounce some of these things incorrectly. Um, Daniel Bull asks, you look into the FC receptor activation of PC, uh, uh, PLCG2, but what about the TREM2 activation? Do you think different pathways will have different effects on CA2 positive response? So yeah, we have looked at um, various TREM2 activators. It is a bit more complex to go after a TREM2 activator itself. Um, there's a lot of antibodies out there that claim they can do it, but they tend to be not quite as specific as they claim. So we've had people making our own and working on this. And there's slight variations between the human and the mouse, which makes things a bit more interesting. Uh, I do think there will be differences in the pathways. Uh, certainly the LPS, the amyloid, and supercomputer do show some differences. Uh, the actual uh, hyper, hyper response of the calcium release should be fairly similar, though, because it's to do with the enzyme protein itself and the TREM2 work we've done hasn't shown uh, a difference in the trend. Uh, we'll say. Um, you can post your questions again just a reminder using the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Uh, the next question is from Tiago Oliveira who asks, really nice, I understand if you use PIP2 antibody to measure its levels, have you tried to measure levels of PIP2 and DAG uh, biochemically and do the mice have any behavioural alterations? Yeah, so um, we, uh, I showed the PIP2 antibody work there because it's uh, nice graphs and nice images, uh, but we have looked at this in a much more complex way using uh, mass elizers, um and lipidomics and things like that, and also uh, measuring DAG biochemically with uh, various DAG sensors that you can get out of, uh, I think there's a company called um, Montana Molecular that make a, quite a good DAG sensor, um, fluorescent DAG sensor, which works quite well. So we've measured this in a lot of different ways and it all follows the same trend. Uh, and that was uh, just the general PIP2 antibody I showed there. Uh, but we've measured PIP45, PIP345, and PIP3 as well, as well with various like um, images of SHIP1 and other pathways to see if there's effect there. There doesn't seem to be any kind of compensation system being brought into the PIP, so we don't see um, the PIP 
uh, four or five levels being increased because of the depletion level, uh, at least in vitro um, or in the basal um, in vivo level would indicate. Uh, and the DAG sort of follows the same path where you get this increased uh, DAG. DAG breaks down a bit slower than PIP2 anyway, um, so you get that slower, but it tends to be higher in the uh, variants than the wild type compared comparatively in vivo. In vitro, sorry, it's the DAG. Thank uh, you very much. But sorry, um, no, we haven't done any paperwork on this at the moment. Uh, we haven't, you know, in the mice, we haven't noticed any differences. Um, I, I don't think anyone's seen any differences in other work. I know there's longevity questions, uh, but no, we haven't seen anything at the moment. Thank you very much, Tiago. Hope that answers your question. Uh, next one is from uh, Sheedan Solomon, who asks, since amyloid beta is size dependent, do you think clearance of PCLG2 mute, mute, is that mutation will affect since uh, phagocytosis pathway is reduced? Yes, <laughs> uh, I think almost definitely. Um, I think the question there is, which is the most dangerous uh, form of a beta? Um, we're talking about size dependency. A lot of work now is saying that oglomas um, are the most toxic form, so the most one to clear, and that's going to be more of endocytosis. Whereas the fibrils, um, the danger really comes from the neuroinflammation side of it and the microglosis around them. I do think our data would indicate in vitro wise that the phagocytosis would be reduced. That's something we're looking at in vivo and examining it at the moment, so I can't give you a definitive answer. Um, but I would be very surprised if there were no differences. Thank you very much. I hope that's answered your question. Um, we've got another question from uh, Dawn Lau. Uh, remember, you can use the post your questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Uh, Dawn Lau asks, have you looked at uh, Vivos uh, Fag... Uh, have you looked at uh, Vivo Fagus? Why well, I, I simply can't say it. <laughs> go, go on, Tom. Help me out. Uh, Phagocytosis of mice to see if there's any difference in uh, synaptic pruning, for example. Um, so that's what one of the things I'm looking at now. Um, COVID shut down, obviously. Um, I think the synaptic pruning is fascinating. Uh, there's a whole complement side of things, as I mentioned, that we haven't got into, and there are people uh, working on that. I think uh, we did a podcast the other day on a site where um, Sarah and Megan from the DRI both talked about compliment, which I, if you're interested in that, I think you're well worth for listening to them. Um, and so that whole side of it there and how that's linked to synaptic pruning. There is a question you now, we've affected Vegas this, this way. Is there going to be an effect on synaptic pruning? And also, I mean, there's also a question of how that's going to affect developmental changes. Um, PSC2 isn't linked to any development changes that I've seen, but I also don't know if anyone's looked. Um, so I think there's a whole side of it there, which it makes perfect sense that there would be an effect, but these things become incredibly complex uh, when other systems are involved, like complements and um, optimization of these uh, various things. So different pathways get activated. So I think it is a lot of work to be done there, but I do think it'll be very interesting and it's what I'm looking at. Thank you very much, Dawn. I hope that's answered your question. Uh, next question is from Daniel Bull. Uh, and actually, this is the question I was going to ask if we didn't get any more. Uh, what are the next experiments you plan to do regarding the protective variant to support or further validate this study? Uh, so for this particular study, there's a lot more lipidomics work that needs to be done. Uh, as I said, um, lipid metabolism has been involved in a lot of the risk variants and things like that that have come out of some of these GUR studies. So I think we need to have a look at a lot of that. Um, lipids are classically very hard to look at. They tend to vary very fast. Um, so I think there's a lot of data there to be looked at and a lot of work to be done. The Vegaso stuff we talked about before, I think we need to have a look at that in vivo and get some data there. Um, Septic pruning, but also just um, there are some fake data assays that you can do in vivo to examine it. We're doing a lot of stuff. Um, only, because this is so competitive, I'm only allowed to talk about so many things. Um, but yeah, we've got a lot of looking at the information side of the things and how this affects through the developmental stage of life to look at as well. Thanks, Tom. <clears throat> and as uh, Tom mentioned uh, a few moments ago, we also uh, were lucky enough to record a podcast uh, with Tom and a couple of his colleagues uh, last week and that'll probably be out in about uh, four weeks time I think so if you're not already a follower of our podcast you can find it on iTunes, Spotify and all the usual podcast places to search for Dementia Researcher um, 
you'll find we've we've talked about microglia a few times uh, over the last couple of years. So please do check out our podcast um, to pick up more. Um, we've got a question now from Lorenza Magno who asks, "How do microglia look? Uh, how do microglia look like in brain of KI mice? Uh, is morphology affected? Any effects on other cell types?" So Lorenzo, I do know, and she was the one who did the, the gain of function uh, paper that I spoke about in the uh, presentation. Um, Does this mean it's a trick in, question? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in the knock-in mouse, um, morphology, we haven't looked at in a huge amount of detail yet. It's one of the things we're looking at. I've not seen any massive changes um, or in vitro, and other cell types don't seem to be heavily affected. Uh, I do think that aging is one of the key things, and that's what we're looking at, see how this will go a long time. Um, and I think also there's the gliosis back there. Um, but we haven't seen a huge amount of morphological changes uh, in vitro or in vivo at the moment. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, I think that's the last of your questions. If anybody has any last ones, please quickly add them now. Um, I'm just going to thank you very much uh, again for joining us and agreeing to share Tom. Um, I know that there are always opportunities coming up at the DRI in Cardiff. So if you'd like to become a colleague of, of uh, Tom's and find out more about the work of the UK Dementia Research Institute, they have a fantastic website and a really lively, active Twitter feed where they're always sharing their work uh, and uh, opportunities to go and work in their labs too. So do check that out. Um, our next webinar is on Wednesday, the 27th of May at 3.15 p.m. Uh, PM with Joanna Sun from the University of Wollongong in Australia. And uh, Joanna will be presenting on adapting an Australian assessment, uh, environmental assessment tool called HiCare um, for use in other environments. Um, the recording from today, uh, details of future webinars and how to register for Joanna's, can all be found on our website at dementiaresearcher.nihr.ac.uk forward slash webinars. Please do register there because you'll also get a, a short news summary each Friday which gives you all the, the information that we've posted in the week which includes future webinar events, our podcasts, um, articles and blogs by, by uh, other people as well, all uh, focused around early career dementia researchers. Finally, if you'd like to join us and present your own work, you can do that as a midday lecture as well. So just drop us a line on Twitter at dem underscore researcher or use the contact us page on our website. Thanks very much again, Tom. That was really fascinating. And Thanks for having um, me. I hope we can invite you back. Oh, one last question. You cut it short there, Johnny. We were uh, literally about to go. Um, do you want to take this? Go on, Tom. We'll, we'll, Give you this one. Did PCLG2 variant show uh, variant showed any changes in psychokines levels? Psychokines. Uh, so the answer to that is it's complex. We're looking at the moment, and I'm not allowed to say. Oh, great! Sorry. Subject of a future publication. Yeah. Thank you very much again, Tom. It's been uh, fascinating, and thank you everybody for joining us today and for uh, uh, asking the questions and being part of the conversation. Thank you.